Welcome to part two of the work and energy video lecture. So we will begin this lecture talking about conservation of energy. In previous lectures, we've defined work, we've defined kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, and thermal energy. So now we'll see how it all fits together in conservation of energy. So the law of conservation of energy is one of the fundamental laws of the universe. It states that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. So as long as there is no work done by external forces on your system, then you add up all the energies. Initially, something happens within the system, a rock falls off a cliff, a ball hits a spring, uh, something slides down a friction uh, slide, and then you add up all the energies at the end and the two numbers are the same. So here it is as an equation, the general form that has the work in it, that's if that's not an isolated system. So that's something doing work externally to the system. But if you go down here for the isolated system, no external forces, then we see that if here it is adding up all the energies initially, and this U includes both elastic and gravitational, it equals all the final energies plus any energy that's gone into heat. And the heat always goes on the side with the final energy because it's something that is, you can't get it back, it's, it's lost, but it's still within the system. Okay, so we'll just review the formulae here. Um, there's kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Remember, this is always a positive quantity. V is speed, it doesn't matter what the direction is. And the way you know whether something has kinetic energy, you just ask yourself, is it moving? or is it not moving? If it's moving, you calculate kinetic energy. The next formula here for gravitational potential energy, mgy. Remember the crucial thing is defining y equals zero. You must do that before you get going into your problem. And I like to choose the very lowest position that the object ever finds itself in to be zero, y equals zero. And then it would mean you would always be positive. But it's okay if, if u equals zero somewhere halfway through its path vertically up, then you would have a negative gravitational potential energy. So you simply ask yourself when you're doing the problem, is there a change in height? So something falls off a cliff, goes down a slide, then you're gonna to have to worry about this gravitational potential energy term. If it's just going on a horizontal surface, then that gravitational potential energy before and after would be the same, so it doesn't come into your equation. So the elastic potential energy, that's if you have a spring. So you just ask yourself, is there a spring? Is there a bungee cord? Uh, maybe a trampoline, but that's, those are the problems where you're gonna use elastic potential energy. Now, once again, this X, that's how much the spring has compressed or stretched from equilibrium. So, and it's always positive, this number as well. So whether you stretch a spring or compress it, doesn't matter. Elastic potential energy is always positive. Okay, so this is how I like to do these problems. Make a table. So we have a table that has position as one column, kinetic energy as a column, gravitational potential energy as a column, elastic spring energy as a column, heat, I'm just going to call it heat, and then total. Okay, so these are the columns that you would start every single problem with. Okay, now you then look at particular positions of the object. So the top of the cliff, the bottom of the cliff, the spring before it was stretched, after it was stretched, the ball halfway up in the sky, whatever's going on, we would have these positions, A, B, C. Okay, so you define those positions of interest. Now you go along and you decide what's going on at position A. So let, I'm just gonna use some Pull some numbers out of a hat. So let's say somebody's bungee jumping. They jump off a cliff. They've got gravitational potential energy on the cliff. They start moving, they're gonna have kinetic energy. There's a bungee cord involved, it's gonna stretch and it's gonna then come back to its original length as you fly back up in the air. So let's say we've got no kinetic energy at position A, this will be at the top of the cliff. We've, we're at the top of a cliff, so we've got 100 joules of gravitational potential energy. This bungee cord is slack haven't generated any heat yet. You never have heat initially, heat comes later. 
Okay, once you have this row, you go across the row and you add them all up, and this is your total. Okay, so this is total energy. Now that total stays the same no matter where the object is. So once you have this 100, now you go down the column. Must be 100 there, must be 100 here. So you know the total always equals 100. Okay, now you go to another position. So let's say the person's jumped off the cliff and some kinetic energy starts being, um, the object now has kinetic energy. It's losing potential energy because it's going down the cliff. Let's say it's fallen down quite a bit and we're at maybe, I don't know, quite low down here, 10 joules. And then the bungee cord is getting warm or maybe the body's getting warm if it's zooming through the air, whatever. So we've got some heat being generated. The question is, what must the spring energy be at that position? And the way you figure it out is you just go along your, your row, you know it, the row has to add to 100 here. And so 20 plus 30, sorry, 20 plus 10 is 30, plus five is 35. This must be 65. And it's as simple as that. It's just a bookkeeping, add all the energies up to get the total. Okay, let's say now you go further down and you stop just before your head hits the water in this bungee jump. So you've stopped. We've defined the water as zero. There is nothing there. And the bungee cord's gotten a little bit warmer. So now it's 30 joules. Or no, let's say, I won't, maybe I won't talk, well, it doesn't matter, 30 joules. And then the question is, how much energy has been stored up in the spring? Well, once again, you go across your row. Clearly, if the, the sum is 100, this must be 70 joules. OK, so this is the bookkeeping method of keeping total energy straight no matter where the object is. Then, of course, in any given column, you have to use the formula to get what you're asked. So remember, this is 1 half mv squared. So maybe you would be asked at point B, what's the speed? Well, then you know the kinetic energy is 20. Put it into this formula, get the speed. And at any location, mgy. Um, we're going to define zero at the water. So if we know the potential energy at any location, we pop it into this MGY, we find out where it is. Similarly here, this is one half KX squared. And so if we know what the elastic potential energy is at any of these locations, we simply put it into this formula. We can find out how much the bungee cord has stretched. Now for heat, in this case, this heat would be something we wouldn't have a formula for this. So if it's air resistance or heat generated in a bungee cord, there's no formula. But if it was friction, so this would be a special case if there's friction, then you would use the formula that heat is the force of friction times the distance over which the friction is acting. And remember, this is a positive number, always positive. So this is positive. And it's been added into our total energy in the correct way here. Now, if you were trying to fit this to the formula, the, if you go from A to B, then A would be initial, B would be final. B to C, B would be initial, C would be final. You can go A straight to C, A would be initial, C would be final. It doesn't matter which is initial and final. These numbers all add up in the same way. Okay, so let's use this table method and do an example. Here's an example. So, so let's just draw a picture. Is somebody sliding down a slide? Down like this. And then coming off the slide at a certain speed. Okay. So here it is. Doesn't really matter where they leave the slide here. Okay, so the main part of the slide is five meters long. So this is five meters. There is friction. Um, we don't have a coefficient of friction, but we know there is friction, so there will be heat in this example. We have an angle of 30 degrees. And we know some things. We know the speed here. Now, let, first, before you do anything, you draw the picture, and now you decide where's A, where's B. Okay, or if there's three points you're interested in, where's C? But in this case, there's only two. So let's make point A at the top here. So there's our A. 
and B will be at the bottom. Here's B. Okay, so now we start thinking about there's kinetic energy and we do have gravitational potential energy here because we have a change in height. And we do have heat, but we don't have any elastic. So we don't have to worry about elastic. Okay, the next thing you always wanna do, define y equals zero. Where are you gonna have zero? Well, the obvious place is down here, y equals zero. Okay, and then we're gonna need the height of A. So we're gonna need this. This would be y A. And from that triangle, we can see that the sine of 30 is opposite over hypotenuse. And so y would be five sine 30, which is 2.5 meters, y A. As much information as we can get from these points A and B we're gonna, will help us fill in that table. So what else do we know here? At A, at rest, okay? So we know VA, zero. At B, two meters per second. So now we've got VB, two meters per second. Okay, and we have the mass 24 kilograms. We're gonna need that to calculate both kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Okay, so this is just the problem laid out. That's what we're given. Now let's make our table. Okay, so we've got position, we've got kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, heat, and total. There's no elastic here, so it's a little bit easier. Okay, we've got two positions, A, B. Oh, I made those lines a little too long. Okay, so what do we know? Is there kinetic energy? You go, let's look at each entry. Is there kinetic energy at A? No. Is there potential energy at A? Yes, M, G, Y, A. Is there heat initially? No, there's never heat initially. And so we have a total. The total will be M, G, Y, A. So we need to calculate that number, M, G, Y, A. Let's see what the total is, 24 kilograms, times 9.8 times 2.5 meters. Okay, now what does that equal? That equals 588 joules. Okay, so going across this row, zero plus 588 plus zero is 588, that's the total. Now, once we have the total, we go down. It must be 588 at point B as well. Now my columns here are getting a little funny. Okay, now we go to point B. Is it moving? Yes, it's moving and we know its speed. So this is one half mv squared, which we can work out because we have both the mass and the speed. So this is half of 24 times two meters per second squared, which equals 48 joules. That's 48. Okay, does it have gravitational potential energy at B? No, it's at the bottom. Now these three numbers, K, U, G, and heat, have to equal 588. So what must this number be? Well, it must be 588 minus 48. So this number must be 588 minus 48. And so that must be 540. And so the heat generated by the friction as that person goes down that slide is 540 joules. And that's the answer. So heat equals 540 joules. Okay, so keeping these, keeping this little table I think really helps. Okay, let's do another one, see how, um, how it goes with the speed of a spring launched ball. Okay, so now we're gonna have elastic. So it's a spring loaded to, uh, toy gun, launching the plastic balls. We've got a spring constant, we've got the compression of the spring, and we wanna know how fast the ball's moving when it leaves this little gun. Now, we're gonna put the gun horizontally so that we don't have any gravitational potential energy to worry about. Okay, now it doesn't matter whether you shoot it left or right, because remember, kinetic energy has to do with speed, positive number, elastic potential energy, is x squared positive, everything's positive. So um, 
I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Should we shoot it right? So let's shoot it to the right. Okay, so it's the ball we're interested in here. So let's assume we've squished this spring and this ball is on it here and it's been compressed. So spring compressed uh, 10 centimeters. All these numbers are 10, 10 centimeters. You're gonna to have to put that in meters. So we'll let's right away put that in 0.1 meters. Okay, so that would be X. Oh, now we're gonna call this position A. So that's A. And then this, this ball is gonna come shooting out. Once the spring has relaxed back to its equilibrium, the ball is just gonna leave that surface and it's gonna be moving. This will be position B and this will be V, B. And that's what we're trying to find. Don't know how fast it's going when it comes out here. Okay, and now Y equals zero. We don't have to worry about Y equals zero because there is no change in height here. Okay, so let's, oh, and we've got K. That tells you how springy the spring is. So we need that for the elastic potential energy. And we have the mass. We need that for kinetic energy, 10 grams, which immediately we're gonna to have to go to kilograms, 0 0.010 kilograms. Okay. And we don't have to worry about friction, so we're not gonna have heat. Okay, so let's make our table again. We've got A when it's compressed, B when it's slack. So this is now um, slack. There is no elastic energy left. It's giving it all to the mass. Okay, so let's do our table. Position, we've got kinetic energy, no gravitational, but we've got elastic. And then we have total, there's no heat. Okay, so maybe I can do this a little more organized here. We've got A, I'll leave more space this time, and B. Okay, so we go to point position A. Is the ball moving? Well, it's not because someone's holding it against that spring ready to release it, so it's not moving. Has there been energy stored in a spring? Yes, it's been compressed. And so this would be one half K X squared. So we can calculate that right away. One half K is 10 newtons per meter. X 10 centimeters was 0.1 meter squared. So it's not much energy here. It's just a little, little gun. 0 0.05 joules of elastic energy. So now we go across our row, zero plus 0 0.05. Our total is 0 0.05. And it would remain that if you're neglecting friction all the way out as the spring starts to relax back to equilibrium, the speed starts to pick up. And so we could do it halfway along if we wanted to. We could ask, you know, what's the speed halfway along? And these two numbers, kinetic plus elastic, would still have to equal 0 0.05. Okay, so now we go down. This, is, this has to be 0 0.05 because total remains constant. Okay, at point B, it's left the spring. The spring is relaxed, nothing's stored up anymore. Therefore, we know the kinetic has to be this 0 0.05. Okay, and we know that, that the formula for that, K is one half mv squared. And so V must be two K over M square rooted. And so this would be two. Now you see these Ks, be careful here. That's why I use Ke for kinetic energy. This is kinetic energy. This is the spring constant. They're not the same thing, totally different, nothing to do with each other. So that's a little bit of a dangerous notation. Can't remember if the textbook uses a small K or not. Um, often it is a small K and this is a capital K. Mine don't look different, they should look different. Okay, but this is kinetic energy here I'm doing down here. The mass of the ball was 10 grams, so 0 0.01 kilograms. And we get the speed to be 3.16 meters per second.
Okay, so that's how fast the ball would be coming out of that little toy gun. A more interesting question would be if you shot the ball vertically up, how high would it go until it ran out of all energy and it just turned into potential, gravitational potential and energy and then comes back down. So maybe I'll do that in another video. Okay, so the last topic for this lecture series here is power. Definition of power is the rate at which energy is being transformed. So if you run up a pair of stairs and you're having more potential energy at the top, the, how fast you run up is uh, very important as far as your power is concerned. The faster you go, the more power that you're generating. So notice how time is on the bottom. So this is energy in joules. And then this is time in seconds. And then P is power in watts. So a joule per second is a watt. That's the SI. We often use kilowatts, um, not to be confused with kilowatt hours, which is what you pay for, for your electricity bill, but that's an energy unit, that is not a power unit. So as soon as you multiply a watt times a time, you're talking about energy. Now, usually we, we often use work as the energy that's being generated or consumed or dissipated. So this energy could be any of those things, but it still has joules, units of joules. Okay. Now, often we're interested in, for example, you're driving along in your car, the force required to keep the car moving at constant speed is the force to overcome all the frictional forces, whether it's the road friction or air resistance, drag. Um, clearly you have to keep the motor on as you drive. And so the question is, if you're driving at a certain speed, how much force uh, do you need to maintain that speed? And so here's the de derivation of power in terms of that. Now this has to be average. All these quantities have to be like average power. This would be the average force. And so they don't put that here, but it's pretty well always average force um, because there are often so many forces or the force is changing as things speed up or slow down. Uh, that's in Newtons. And then this is just speed, not velocity. Uh, power is a scalar quantity, is not a vector. So this is speed in meters per second. And you can see, you multiply those together, a Newton times a meter per second. Remember a Newton times a meter is a joule. And so sure enough, that's a joule per second, which is a watt. Not to be confused with work here, that's watt. Okay, so this is actually a handy formula if you're, if you're asked for what average force um, is applied if the power in the motor is such and such and the car is moving at some average speed. Okay, so here's an example of a elevator being pulled up by a cable. So there's force of tension in this cable. It's going at constant speed. So the force of tension must equal the force of gravity because, this, because there's no acceleration. So this must equal the force of gravity. So this would be 1600 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So I'm not sure what that number is. Let's just work that number out. Okay, so that's 1.57 times 10 to the four Newtons. Okay, and now the question is, what power must be delivered by the motor to keep that car moving up 35 meters in 10 seconds? So we have two choices. We can work out the average speed, 35 over 10. So V average, well, it's constant, so it's okay here, would be 35 meters over 10 seconds. So it's moving at 3.5 meters per second. And so the power must be the force exerted times the speed it's going. And so P is F times V.
And so you simply multiply these two numbers together. And when you do, you get 54.9 kilowatts. Okay, so that's times 10 to the three. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty heavy duty motor. Okay, so that I think that takes us to the end of this lecture.